Welcome to another episode of the Bleeding Edge of Digital Health. I've got Miha Brickstone with me today. <laughs> We're laughing because I'm uh, I'm notorious for botching uh, botching bad. names here. <laughs> really, but not that bad. Uh, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, uh, pleasure to have you here today. He's the CEO and co-founder of Neuralight, a computer vision and deep learning startup that's making some big waves in uh, the world of neurological disorders. Really appreciate you, you making the time to come on today and, and definitely looking forward to getting into to the nitty gritty of what you guys have going on. It's pretty exciting. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. It's a pleasure being here and thank you for inviting me to your show and very much looking forward to the discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I was doing some research for the show today and it's not often that I get kind of in tall grass from a 50,000 foot perspective technologically speaking, but I got to tell you, this stuff is very advanced, highly technical, and very forward-looking, which I would uh, that much more fun to research the company and whatnot. You got your hands in, a, in, a, in several different pots, so to speak, in terms of uh, what you guys are doing with the platform. Why don't we do this to get started? Can I just have you give us just a general kind of overview of what Neuralite is, the, the platform does today, and then kind of some of the other offshoots that you guys are pursuing, maybe, you know, downrange a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So first, thanks, Mike, for talking about the technical depth, the scientific depth. Um, those are things we pride ourselves on very, very much. Uh, we didn't take on a uh, an, an easy challenge in not only wasn't it easy or isn't it easy, but it's uh, also not exactly within our comfort zone to begin with, at least not looking, you know, a year and a half, a year and three months back. Rather, it was really, you know, kind of the thought that, you know, there's a comfort zone and then there's where magic happens. And as repeat entrepreneurs that have built uh, successful companies in the past and could really choose uh, what we wanted to do with the rest of our lives and, you know, how to impact the world in the most effective way. We decided to take on um, a challenge that is formidable, to say the least, uh, but one that also when with and when we're successful will have a deep impact on the world. So, you know, to kind of give you, give you the backdrop. So neurology today, and, you know, most neurologists will agree with this, although they may not like the wording, is much more an art than it is a science. It's a clinical art, uh, much more than it is a science. Diagnosis today is done as a clinical diagnosis. There isn't a, for the vast majority of indications, there is no objective biomarker. There aren't any blood tests or MRIs are not really uh, good in, in in defining the disease and no real other way to, to diagnose and monitor the progression of the disease. So the, the real problem today with neurology, or one of the real problems, uh, other than the fact that there aren't many uh, disease modifying cures out there is that there really isn't a way to measure, to diagnose and measure the disease itself. And you know, there's a saying in business that you can't improve what you can't measure. Uh, my previous company was measuring sales conversations. So there was, you can't approve where you don't measure, we measure the sales call. Here, I think it's a more noble cause or calling. You can't, you can't develop drugs for diseases you don't measure, and we're measuring the neurological disorders. And, you know, we'll go into how we do that in a bit. But I think first, it's really important to understand how real that saying is. So, you know, today, the, the world is such that, it, you know, if you suffer every... One of us knows somebody that suffers or has suffered from depression. When you go into a psychiatrist or, or a GP's office, they'll ask you a bunch of questions such as, you know, how's your appetite? How's your sleeping? Do you have any suicidal thoughts? And so on and so forth. And kind of take a, a clinical observation of where you are, and then come back and say, look, so the, the, the medication is working or not working, or let's increase the dosage, let's change the, the medication, so on and so forth. And that's how they prescribe medicine. That's how they, they help, you know, with MDD, depression, and, and other similar diseases, anxiety. And in fact, the same exact situation occurs with diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, and ALS. That's how you, A, diagnose and B, monitor the disease, which is a bit insane. So as an example for Parkinson's, there's 50 questions. They're called the UPDRS, so the, the Unified Parkinson Disorder Scale. 50 questions, you get about zero to four for each question. You sum it up and that's how much Parkinson's you have. Um, as you can imagine, the amount of variability is insane. You're getting about 25 to 30% inner rate of variability. That means 
if two physicians see the same patient at the same day, you know, one after the other, they will agree with each other about 75% of the time. So, I mean, good luck monitoring with so much noise. In, in the, yeah. That leads to a lot of misdiagnosis, I got to think, obviously. This is post-diagnosis, right? This is measuring the acuity of the disease, right? The progression of the disease. The acu- but you're absolutely right. Diagnosis is also very bad. Uh, Parkinson's specifically is a, is a disease or an indication that um, has many other diseases that look very similar to it. So MSA, essential tremor, Parkinson, and the whole family of Parkinsonisms look very, very similar, despite the fact that their uh, pathophysiology and etiology may be very, very different. So these diseases look very similar at the beginning, uh, very hard to tell them apart. You you need to be an extremely well-versed and specialist movement disorder neurologist. And even then there's many mistakes, right? So you, you get a situation where in these clinical trials for Parkinson's, if you have a thousand patients, you can assume that about 250 don't actually suffer from Parkinson's. How insane is that? And how crazy is it to expect that one would be able to develop a drug for these uh, diseases when the measurement is so noisy? So, Because even if you, if you extrapolate that out, if a drug is developed for people that don't really have Parkinson's, then is that drug actually well suited for that person who has Parkinson's or, you know, like it's coming and going, it's ineffective. So luckily or unluckily, those drugs won't be granted uh, a regulatory approval because they just statistically will come out insignificant, right? That you're going to see so much noise in there, right? You're going to be testing a hypothesis, right? Looking at a molecule, looking at an agent, you have a thousand people to begin with, the molecule probably doesn't affect all the patients, right? So uh, you know, half of them will be respondents, say, if it's a good drug, and then another, whatever, half of the Parkinson people will not be respondent. And then the people outside of the, uh, that don't suffer from Parkinson, which are a quarter of the people, introduce so much noise because they'll be all over the place. So the chances of a drug like that being approved are very, very slim. So it's, it's just inefficient. Well, it's more than inefficient. You have these drugs not being approved, right? Because... Right. And if you look at the success rate for drugs being approved for CNS, for central nervous systems versus uh, non-CNS drugs, you see that it's less than half the approval rate, right? Not to speak about them being non-disease modifying cures, but the, even the, the mere chances of them succeeding is very, very low because there's so much noise in the system. Noise from misdiagnosis and noise from also the, the measurement itself. So, you know, that's part of the area that we help with. Other challenges that neurology faces today are, you know, again, in measurement, the fact that these diseases are so slow progressing often. So if you would want to develop a drug for, say, MS, usually it takes two years for MS to move on the, what's called the EDSS scale, right? That's also a, um, a clinical scale for evaluation. So it would take you two years approximately to see deterioration on the EDSS scale. And I don't want to say a non-startup, but good luck setting up a trial that at the bare minimum, it will take you two years to see if the molecule has helped anything or not, right? Because you won't be able to see that deterioration has stopped or progressed in less than two years. That's a huge amount of time to keep the person on medication in a trial that you have no idea what's, what's happening there. You know, that's kind of the backdrop or the context of things. So neurology, again, today is decades and decades behind uh, other areas of medicine that are more, you know, have more science behind them, like oncology. We don't have today, medicine doesn't have today, other than conditions, of course, like stroke or, or trauma to the brain, we have very little capability of putting together these objective and sensitive biomarkers. In fact, there really aren't any that are considered at least not a primary endpoint for, for the FDA or for regulatory purposes. There are some biomarkers that help, like MRIs are helpful, right? You will see MRI showing up lesions when you have MS, right? Uh, but, but it's a secondary endpoint. It's not correlated deeply. You know, volume of lesions is not correlated uh, in a strong way with the progression of the disease. So Neurolite enters the stage in, in, in that situation where there's a, a dearth or a lack of uh, biomarkers that are objective and sensitive. And that's what we're trying to solve for. Uh, so that's kind of the backdrop, and I'm happy to to explain. I'll pause for a second and see if you have any uh, clarification questions, but that's kind of the context we're working. 
Yeah, no, there's such a, a huge need there. I've, I've long contended, you know, the, the brain is the last frontier in medicine. It's the place that we still know very little about. There's still radical subjectivity to it. Yeah, we just don't have really good answers. I mean, just personally speaking, I deal with uh, restless leg syndrome on a significant basis. And, you know, the drugs that they, they prescribe for that, they're Parkinson's drugs. And, you know, a lot of times people, you know, will get diagnosed with, with restless leg syndrome and they don't have it. They've got peripheral neuropathy or they've got a lot you of know, other things that can behave and, and, and mimic restless leg syndrome. And to your point, the amount of work in the clinical trial space is not what it should be for these reasons, because they can't get these, these, these products, you know, to market. And, and, um, it, it's, you know, another thing that, came to mind when you were talking about this. I had a friend that was recently diagnosed with MS at 43 years old, or no, I'm sorry, 45 years old. And, you know, me and a couple of our friends were talking and to the one friend who spoke to him directly at the time. And, and I said, how did they diagnose him with that? And he goes, well, they gave him a sheet with like 10 questions. And if you get like five or six, you got MS. If you answer yes to five or six, you've got MS. And I said, really? It's very valid what you're saying. Yeah, and it usually also takes quite a bit of time to reach the physician that will diagnose you with MS. Often it's confused with other diseases early on, or you don't know to go to a neurologist, you know, these all kinds of twitching nerve, you feel like it. these diseases are very amorphous, or, or they have a high variability in the symptoms of them. You know, they're all over the place in terms of how quickly the symptoms appear, every person presents differently, or many people present differently. So 100%, it's really really difficult. And as you mentioned earlier, all of these motor disorders, uh, movement disorders, you know, many of them are caused by, by lack or, or problems with the, with the dopamine uh, pathway. Uh, many of the drugs are the same, but for different reasons. And uh, dosaging, titration is extremely, extremely challenging for, for Parkinson's. So indeed, you know, and, and you touched upon you know, the patient side, which I, I admitted, of course, the end game is to, for us is to introduce this novel or new uh, standard of evaluation, but also care for neurology. We're going through pharma to begin with just because, you know, you can't introduce novel care before you're regulated for it. So, you know, the product that we're selling is a decision-making platform for pharma companies to help design and uh, conduct better trials. So we've established an obvious and significant use case. Let's get into the product. What is it that you guys are building? And let me ask you this, before we even get started, where, where are you in the regulatory process? I actually prefer not to disclose everything, but we're moving extremely aggressively where you would think one would move in order to get to a breakthrough designation and ultimately a surrogate endpoint. Uh, but we're, we're moving full force on that and the expectation, you know, it's going to take time, you know, getting a surrogate endpoint takes years, um, which is okay. Right. You want to build up the evidence that you're real for regulatory purposes from day zero, which we're doing very, very nicely without going. This is the type of product because some of these software overlays, these AI overlays of like a, a CT or an MRI or whatever, they don't they don't even require FDA approval. But because this is going to be a, di a diagnosing tool, you're going to need clear like FDA approval for that, right? Yes, but the value proposition to begin with is very much not needed, doesn't need an FDA, which is why we decided to go this this route. So maybe. Uh, a few points here are, you know, one is how you build out the product, which is really important uh, that, you know, we're doing everything right so that every evidence that we do collect along the way will be able to leverage towards a regulatory approval. Got it. But also really importantly, you know, doing what we're doing now and selling this at this decision making platform does not require regulatory approval yet. We're not advertising anything to patients, right? We're selling right. capability to pharma companies and we're leveraging, you know, data we've collected from thousands of, of, uh, of healthy volunteers, but also uh, from patients that we've started working with and measuring in the right clinical setting to be able to, you know, leverage these uh, data uh, to build uh, the credibility that we need. So 100% uh, we're, you know, we are navigating ourselves on the right route towards um, uh, FDA approval, but this could be a hugely successful company 
you know, I'm talking multi-billion dollar company, even without regulatory approval. That's yep. not to say that we're not going to go there, but, but, you know, simply, you know, just to give you a taste of this today, pharma companies spend $600 million a year on MRI, uh, get this, on MRI for two diseases, for MS and AD, for MS and Alzheimer, multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer, despite the fact, and this is the important part, that MRI is not approved as a primary endpoint for any one of these diseases. Again, <laughs> so $600 million are spent by pharma on an objective endpoint that is not a primary endpoint, an, an objective measure that isn't a primary endpoint, which is insane given you know what's called the radiological paradox right the, the the fact that the you know yes mri is good for diagnosis of ms but not for the progression of the disease right volume of lesion mm -hmm. is not correlated strongly with the progression of the disease so it's a crazy situation where hundreds of millions of dollars are spent by pharma a year on a measurement that is not primary and approved endpoint so if all we could do quote unquote all is replace MRI by something that is a, as objective as MRI, but much more accurate and much more sensitive, then you have hundreds of millions of dollars to take off the table, right? So easily there and no, obviously, again, no, no regulatory approval, very minimal regulatory approval uh, needed there. Of course, our aspirations are much bigger. We're not here to, to make, uh, build something small or, or, or modest. We're here to really uh, redefine the way neurology is measured today. Uh, and evaluated and, and cared for. So for that, you ultimately do need regulatory approval, but that's a longer a longer journey. So let's get into it. Yeah, why don't you, uh, given you know uh, your, uh, an explanation or description of of the software and kind of how it works and and what it is you guys are building? Sure. You know, over the last uh, fifteen or twenty years, over seven hundred different papers have been published on the connections or the correlations between. Um, ocular metrics or micro measure micro movements of the eye and neurological disorders so uh, it turns out that uh, all of these neurological disorders have a special uh, signature and that signature is uh, gleanable or can be gleaned from parameters in the eye specifically uh, micro movements in the eye so you can imagine to oversimplify for certain types of dementia one will see a uh, slowing down of horizontal movements of the pupil, but not in uh, vertical movements of the pupil. That's Again, it's oversimplifying. It's not incorrect. It's just oversimplifying. Uh, for other diseases, you're going to see the inability to overcome uh, an instinct to uh, follow a dot from side to side. So inability to move away from uh, something that is moving in one direction or uh, called antisaccadic movement. So we look at um, over a hundred of di these different measurements, uh, saccadic movement, antisaccadic, uh, smooth pursuit, uh, pupil dilation, uh, blinking rates, et cetera, et cetera, over a hundred of these different uh, parameters. And we ask a person to do a task of a few minutes on a computer screen uh, or on a uh, mobile phone and ask them to track these stimuli on the screen. And once we, we measure them for a few minutes, mm -hmm. we're able to extract a fingerprint, uh, basically, of uh, or eye print, so to speak, of the way the eye looks, and correlate that with a the disease that the person suffers from, and b the acuity of the disease. This sounds a little like science fiction, right? But over 700 papers, including in the Lancet, Neurology, Brain, Movement Disorder journals, so the top top journals in the in the field. Um, are presenting this extremely, extremely wide body of work that establishes the correlation between ocular metrics and these neurological indications. Often what you'll see is that the statistical significance is extremely high, so P less than 0, 0, 0, 0001, uh, but with relatively weak correlations or coefficients. And the, the point is that nobody to date has taken, you know, these 100 parameters together. So neuroscientists write these papers. They're very cool. They're not machine learning experts. So they take one or two or three parameters, look at them together, and then kind of manually uh, try to put together the, the strongest model that predicts what disease it is and what the, the acuity of the disease is, which works nicely. But A, it's only one or two or three parameters. B, it's done manually. And three, you know, they're not really able to capture dozens of these parameters because they're using a lab setting where the head is restrained. It's you know, you're using one of these dedicated devices that costs tens of thousands of, of dollars. 
and is limited in the type of information it can glean and, and you know, is dedicated to a specific task. Instead, what we do is take a few minutes in front of the screen uh, and you have over a hundred of these different parameters. We model them using machine learning and then are able to put together this really convincing or compelling picture um, of what disease it is and what stage uh, the disease is at. I think uh, you mentioned before machine learning. So most of the people at our company, including sometimes myself, if you say we're a machine learning company, will kind of like uh, say something, please don't call us charlatans, right? That will be kind of the, 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 the tongue in cheek response because often machine learning is, is a black box, right? You throw in a huge amount of data and hope for the best. And we're really the opposite. We know exactly the circuitries. We know what to expect. We're deep into the science itself. We're working with one of the most established and prestigious uh, clinical centers in the world, uh, DBS, Deep Brain Stimulation, and looking at you know how these circuitries react differently with different movements. So we understand what we're doing. This isn't just pouring in a huge amount of data and, and hoping for the best. Rather, it's a really deep understanding of the science, the circuitries, and what we're looking for. And what we're doing in order to extract um, the parameters at such a high precision using a standard video. Why hasn't anybody else done that? Well, you know, that's a lot of the, the magic um, that my co-founders uh, introduced. So this ability to apply a special subfield of uh, signal processing or a, a family of algorithms called blind deconvolutions that are able to basically glean uh, subpixel resolution or subpixel information from a standard video. So standard video is not high enough uh, right, it's not high enough resolution to be able to actually extract this information from it. So what do you do? Well, it's uh, kind of like how people use satellite cameras to, you know, uh, register license plates. Right, it's the the optics can get you only so far, uh, but then you start using you start applying additional knowledge about the world. So for us, it's not looking at a single frame, but rather as a time series of frames. So instead of looking at the picture as it is now, where there's very little information. We look at a series of frames and then we apply uh, additional knowledge about the world. So, you know, the, the physiology of the eye, the rate of the eye of which the eyes would move, the, the ambient light, et cetera, et cetera. We put all of these together and we're able to literally go beyond the level of the pixel and measure these tiny, tiny microscopic measurements of the eye. In fact, when we compare ourselves, you know, standard video, uh, you know, regular camera, uh, to one of these, you know, lab devices that cost tens of thousands of dollars and, and usually requires you to have your head restrained and so on and so forth. We see that A, we're within a margin of error of 1%, give or take, from these devices. And two, that the distribution has a smaller amount of variability, which would probably really? mean, yeah, which would probably mean that we're not only as accurate, but more accurate than these devices, which is insane because... Basically, what we're doing is using software to attain hardware capabilities, which is really, really cool. Yeah. So the first goal is to be able to identify, based on two minutes worth of video that you could take right here from my Apple camera, you'd be able to identify, okay, this individual is has uh, ALS or this individual has MS. Is there concurrently, will that come back and tell you where you fall on that spectrum, how far developed the disease is, or is that a further subset of software applications that have to go over the top of it? No, it's the same actually. So each disease has its unique signature and the signature changes uh, with the progression of the disease. So imagine, I'm oversimplifying, but imagine that you know you can uh, this, you know that one type of dementia, say FTD, frontotemporal dementia, looks uh, has presents with um, you know a slowing of the horizontal movement of the eyes and Alzheimer with the vertical. I'm probably getting this wrong, so you know oversimplifying and maybe slightly wrong in terms of the vertical versus horizontal, but the difference will grow uh, with uh, the progression of the disease. Likewise, for example, with um, saccadic or anti-saccadic uh, delays, you'll see that delay grow with uh, 
you know, with the way the EDSS scale grows with MS. So A, there's a signature for each disease and B, within the signature, you're looking for different uh, different levels there. Got it. So you're looking for, you know, obviously to diagnosis, you're looking for to be able to stage these patients, what stage they're in. What's the goal? We talked about it earlier, but ultimately the goal is to be able to use this for drug development and then eventually, you know, for patient monitoring per se. And then like, how does this get into precision care for patients? Like, is that further down the road or is that, you know, front and center? That's front and center. Look, the reason we're going first for drug development is simply it's the it's the lowest bar to, to, to reach, right? Because of regulatory approval. So it's easier to work with pharma companies earlier on and that's what we're doing. But, you know, when we're working with pharma companies, we're helping them, you know, how do you help with drug development? Well, you help with diagnosis to remove normal from trials, you are offered a platform that is much more sensitive, so trials are shorter, and you're able to produce phenotyping and, and identify subpopulations, which basically lends itself to identify what the type of what the right subpopulation is for that is respondent to a specific drug. Or which stage, you know, like maybe somebody that's in MS stage, whatever, two or three might be better for XYZ drug versus, you know, stage one, two or three maybe better with stage a different drug, got it. And that's exactly, you know, precision medicine or precision neurology, right? Being able to fit a drug to a specific person, you know, here's a subpopulation is exactly what precision neurology is. And that's, you know, we're working on that for day one. From day one, most likely commercially, you know, the, the order of, of affairs is going to be help uh, um, improve trials, in, increase their chances of success, shorten them, make them cheaper and, and better. Uh, that's one. Two is um, potentially as a companion diagnostic to do some precision medicine. And three, ultimately, you know, for the actual care and monitoring of patients, once regulatory approval has been granted, uh, being able to work directly, you know, as selling basically this reimbursable uh, diagnosis and evaluation tool that payers, you know, and and providers pay for, and you can charge a lot of money for commercially. You can also reach and help and touch and impact billions of people as well, which is what we're all about. Yeah, no, that's incredible. Who started the company? It was you and and was it two co-founders? Yeah, so we started out two co-founders, uh, myself and uh, Eddie Benami. He's a award-winning mathematician. He's also uh, the most amazing partner I can think of, an incredible human being. One of those uh, real and rare geniuses that also happens to have an extremely high EQ. Yeah, I was introduced to him as a potential, you know, I, after we had sold or as we were selling the previous company, I was doing a bunch of angel investments, was introduced as a potential uh, angel investor and, and kind of co coach or advisor. And about 30 minutes into the conversation became uh, very clear to me that I would not be investing in him because I really wanted to work with him. And I'm not the best flirter in the world. So it took me three or four weeks to come across as to, for him to understand that I wanted to work with him, which point he asked me if I'd consider exploring the opportunity of maybe working together. Uh, I basically answered, shut the F up. You had me at a low and uh, we've been <laughs> since. So yeah, so we started the company. We I think we incorporated in February or March of 2021, about a year and three months ago, give or take. One of our earliest investors is um, Gil Sklarski, who is a GP at Operator Partners, and he became an advisor very quickly and about half a year ago decided to put his time where his money already was and just joined us as scientific co-founder. And, you know, he, he was previously the CTO of a company called Flatiron uh, Health that, that sold to Rush for close to $2 billion. So, yep. I always like to say that I did not think that uh, Eddie and I could be any better of a founding team, but um, Gil proved me wrong and, and very nicely so. Uh, so it's a, it's a real privilege to have him. And uh, we were lucky enough also to bring on real luminaries. So our chief innovation officer was previously the global head of uh, innovative R&D at uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals. She managed uh, 700 people there. It was very helpful in bringing both uh, Copaxon for MS and Azelect for, for Parkinson's to the market. So, you know, she's helping us sell what she used to buy or used to try to buy. She joined us, you know, we brought her back from retirement basically because, you know, this is such a huge unmet need for her and she had spent 
uh, you know, 26 years of her career basically on this. So, you know, we were very lucky to have her join um, and a bunch of other incredible, incredible, incredible people around us. Uh, extremely strong team, very much value oriented. When we founded the company, we decided to build it on, uh, you know, even before incorporating, Eddie and I came together with three values, which were, see, there were only three because I always forget anything more than three, but I <laughs> You're like me. Yeah. Uh, but one is we're in an urgent mission. So we're looking, you know, we're we're looking for people and building a team that really is dedicated to what we're doing and you know, really wants to make a real dent in the world. So that's number one. Uh, the third one to balance that out is enjoying the ride. So having a good time while doing so. And the second is just psychological safety, simply because I uh I know both empirically and from experience what happens when there isn't psychological safety. So allowing people to bring the best version of themselves and really be themselves and never have to worry that they'll be dismissed or ridiculed or, or admonished publicly. So, you know, that's Google came out with this amazing uh, piece, establishing psychological safety as the most important factor in building these uh, amazingly successful teams. Yep. No, it's a hundred percent true. And I, I think, you know, it's where I think you're only going to see that become more front and center as time goes on, you know, especially in this great, whatever they're calling it, the great migration or the great uh, res uh, resignation. People are picking up and leaving jobs where they don't, you know, where they're not, where it's not resonating with them. And sometimes they don't even have another job, but they're like, you know what, I'll find one. Yeah, Those types of values are, you know, Definitely more more than just buzzwords this day and age when you're, you know, when you're trying to recruit high, you know, highly uh, sought after talent for sure. Now, are you guys commercially available for the drug development side yet? Yeah, we've just signed our first commercial contract with a, uh, a pharma company, uh, working very closely on an ALS trial with them. Already have first data in. Really exciting. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. For the commercial model, I guess it would be kind of threefold. One would be the drug de development side and then, you know, more on the diagnostic patient monitoring side. The drug development side is pretty, pretty clear because you're you obviously calling it on pharmaceutical companies. But if you were to extend that out into the patient monitoring side, what uh, what would that look like? Who would be the uh, the customer? Who's, who, who, you know, who would you be selling to? Would it be hospitals? Would it be offices? Oh, and then who would be the, uh, the end user? For pharma and drug development, it's very clear. It's more nuanced, of course, right? You know, what exactly are you selling? Are you selling a decision-making platform? Or later on, are you selling, you know, a companion diagnostic potentially to do a kind of a rev share model with, with a pharma company on a specific molecule that you help with? But later on, it's, it is selling to payers and you're selling a reimbursable test. Yeah. Uh, once you have uh, regulatory approval and, uh, you know, the users are uh, most likely, neuro you know, neurologists that uh, prescribe this to users, um, this uh, quick evaluation or monitoring, you can imagine that this it happens during a Zoom call or, uh, you know, on a, on a smartphone, if somebody is being monitored daily and so on and so forth. Well, the patients are being monitored. The user, I see them always as the caregiver, right? You know, to, to right. help to help with managing the disease. Or actually sometimes, you know, there are some diseases like Parkinson where a dosage and administration are really critical in terms of timing to, to maximize on times, reduce off times. You might be able to, you know, one day I, I foresee using our technology to help the patient themselves rather than the caregiver for, for, for a disease like Parkinson's. And, and also in pharma companies earlier on, didn't mention this, but our ability to support remote uh, settings and help with uh, kind of decentralized remote uh, settings, the trials is also huge. Yeah. No, it's incredible stuff. I could sit here and pick your brain about this stuff literally all day long. I want to wrap up. I want to be respectful of your time. What's the best way if people are interested in the company, whether it's, you know, getting involved from an employee perspective or whatnot, what's the best way for people to reach out uh, either to you or to the company? You know, is there, uh, uh, you know, do you guys have a, a LinkedIn feed or uh, what's the best way? Just the website? Yeah. The website has, so thanks for asking, first of all, the website is pretty comprehensive. It describes a lot of the science behind us and, and you know, a bunch about the team. Uh, and, you know, it, there's a partnership uh, tab there where, you know, you can you can contact us uh, specifically for specific indications. 
and uh, for jobs uh, we're just gonna be launching the career page uh, any week now so there'll be an open registry of of, uh, uh, of careers where where or of roles we're looking for uh for in the meantime there's just a contact us you know hello at neurolot uh, hello at okay AI. well listen i'll let you run man i really appreciate you taking the time to come in i know uh you've got a little one that's not doing well and you still made time to show up for the show so i really appreciate that thanks again and definitely um as this thing progresses let's uh let's think about getting you back on the show for for a recap at some point for sure uh, free ipo forward. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I love the sound of that. Yeah. All right, Mika. Thank you very much. Mika Breakstone, CEO, founder of Neuralite. And uh, appreciate you guys tuning in and we'll, we'll catch you on the next show. Thanks so much, Mike. 